Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this NPTEL course on computational process design. Uh, in today's session what we are going to see is, uh, we will be looking at simulation for process flow sheet. So uh, remember in the initial sessions we have seen uh, the simulation of the process flow sheet by using linear mass and energy balance, isn't it? So linear mass and energy balance gives the approximate calculations, but uh, for final cost calculation we require more accurate uh, simulation and calculation of the process flow sheet. So that is what we are going to look at uh, in little bit more detail in today's session. So if you look at the process simulation modes, uh, typically the process simulation can be performed by using two methods. One is the modular approach and the second one is the equation oriented approach. So in uh, modular approach, uh, usually what we do is in modular approach, each of these equipments, each of these units which are there in the process flow sheet, we solve these units individually and then, then we try to connect these with respect to the entire flow sheet and based on that then we do the iterative calculation uh, till we get the uh, all the assumed values same as the output values. Okay. So in modular approach, modular approach is popular for flow sheet design and analysis with detailed process models, but require nested convergence of several calculation loops, making it more robust for non-linear process calculations. So clearly if uh, there are several non-linear equations are there with respect to individual units, in that case approximating these non-linear equations using a linear equations as we have seen in the initial uh, material energy balance session, uh, that is going to give you some error, isn't it? So whenever we have such non-linear models, the better approach is to use a modular uh, uh, process simulation approach in which we can solve all these non-linear equations corresponding to individual units directly and then we will be combining it together, okay. So in the modular approach, convergence involves solving physical property equations at the lowest level unit operations at the middle level and recycle streams in the flow sheet. So uh, you can see that there are three levels in the modular approach. So uh, how we can calculate the properties that will be the lowest level. Then intermediate level we look at solving the individual units and at the highest level then we combine everything uh, with respect to the sequence of the units those are present in the flow sheet and then we try to see uh, whether the inputs for different uh, units which we have assumed in the starting is matching with the predicted values or not. So modular approach input output structure can make it inflexible to uh, flow sheet design specification often necessitating additional calculations loops to meet the requirements. As I said that remember in, in a modular approach we start with some assumed values of input, isn't it? And then we do all the calculation with respect to individual units, isn't it? And clearly these assumed values should be matching finally when we are combining all the units, isn't it? So there are several iterations are required, there are several uh, <coughs> loops are required, isn't it? So the equation oriented approach if you look at in contrast with the modular approach, in equation oriented approach what we do is we take all the equations with respect to different units and we solve all these equations in one go. So in equation oriented approach uh, flow sheet equations are solved simultaneously leading to more efficient solutions with less computational effort compared to the modular approach. The problem with equation oriented approach is primarily the convergence. So see if there are several uh, non-linear equations are there, typically what we do is we use the non-linear equation solvers and all the non-linear equation solvers require a starting values for uh, the uh, problem, isn't it? So typically the convergence depends on what starting values we are using, how accurately, um, uh, how efficiently the uh, non-linear equation solver is. Uh, solving the problem that is also important. Sometimes these non-linear equation solvers can diverge also. Okay. So equation oriented mode allows arbitrary design spec specifications without additional calculation loops but require large scale non-linear equation solver for the entire flow sheet and careful problem initialization for successful solution. Let us take a very simple example, this is a commonly used example in several textbooks. Uh, so this particular flow sheet is referred as Williams and Otto uh, 
flow sheet. Uh, so this particular process is given by Williams and Otto in 1960s. So in this particular flow sheet, you can see that uh, there are different units are there. There is a reactor, then there is a heat exchanger, then there is a decanter and the distillation column. So in the reactor, you can see that the reactant A and reactant B are charged to the reactor and uh, and the recycled stream is also charged to the reactor and in the reactor three reactions are occurring a plus b is giving c c plus b is giving p plus e and p plus c is giving g so in these different uh, species uh, you can see that the c is a intermediate substance p is a primary product e is a secondary product and g is a oily waste uh, by product which we have to remove so uh, the entire effluent which is coming from the reactor then charged to the heat exchanger where the heat is removed from the effluent and uh, this cooled effluent is then uh, charged to the decanter. In the decanter you, you can see that the waste byproduct G is completely removed and the other remaining products are then charged to the distillation column where, where the desired product P is separated as a uh, dis distillate whereas the other products are removed at the bottom. Again, in this case, what we are uh, assuming that uh, the bottom product basically makes a azeotropic mixture and because of that around 10% of uh, product P uh, with respect to the, uh, the component E is getting uh, uh, eliminated, is getting removed in the bottom. So it is not complete 100% separation, 10% product uh, of that of E is uh, forming the azeotropic mixture with the bottom product. Okay. So both C and E holds a value as a fuel commodities, whereas G requires disposal and therefore uh, there is a cost incurred. The plant comprises a reactor, heat exchanger, cooling reactor effluents, a decanter to separate the waste product G uh, from the reactants and other products and distillation column for product P separation. Okay. So now let us look at the model for each of these uh, units which are there in the flow sheet and then we will see how this can be combined in modular and, um, and the equation oriented approach. So uh, if you look at the reactor, in the reactor you can see that F2 is the uh, feed rate of B, F1 is the feed rate of A, FR is the feed rate of the recycle stream and F effluent is the whatever the product stream coming out from the reactor. In this case, if we uh, write the uh, mass balance for individual components. We can write down the mass balance for the component A. So, uh, uh, mass flow rate of component A in the effluent will be given by F A uh, effluent and that is given as F1 A plus F1 uh, F1 A plus F R A minus K1 X A X B V into rho. So in this case, you can see that F1A is nothing but what? F1A is nothing but the mass flow rate of A uh, uh, given as an input through a uh, stream 1 here, this F1A. FRA is nothing but the, the mass, uh, mass flow rate of A which is present in the uh, recycled stream. Okay, So these are nothing but the component A input to the reactor. And <coughs> Remember in this case A is getting reacted with B to produce C, so clearly A is getting consumed by the reaction. So uh, the consumption of the A is also represented through the second term which is nothing but minus K1 XA XB V into rho. Here V is the volume of the reactor uh, and rho is the density of the, uh, the, density of the uh, reactants present in the reactor. Okay. So in this case you can see that this gives us the, uh, uh, the mass flow rate of A coming out from the effluent. Similarly, we can write down the mass balance for the uh, mass flow rate of the uh, component B in the effluent that will be given by F2B plus FRB minus K1XA plus K2XC into XB V rho. So here you can see that <coughs> F2B is nothing but the component B is uh, added to the reactor through this stream F2. Uh, FRB is nothing but the, uh, the uh, amount of B present in the recycled stream. K1XA XB is nothing but the uh, 
B is getting consumed by reaction one. Similarly, K two X C X B is nothing but uh, the B is getting consumed by reaction two and multiplied by volume and density. Similarly, we can write down the mass balance for the component C. So F C uh, effluent is nothing but the mass flow rate of the component C coming out in the effluent that will be given as F R C. So F R C. Remember, in this case, the fresh feed is only for A and B. There is no fresh feed of uh, C is coming in. So F R C is the only input for the C component C. So in this case, component C is primarily coming through the recycled stream. Uh, plus, uh, <coughs> remember, in this case, C is getting produced by reaction one. C is getting consumed by reaction two, and C is getting consumed by reaction three. So all these are represented using this. Entire term which is there in the bracket. Also, component E. If we look at the component E, uh, so uh, in this case, the mass balance for the component E can be written as F C. <coughs> uh, this is this is E. Uh, maybe I'll just correct it. So in this case, you can see that this is for component E. So you can see that the uh, mass balance for the component E can be written as F R E uh, plus two K two X B X C zero. Here you can see that component E is getting produced only by the second reaction, and therefore only second reaction is coming into the picture here. Uh, one more correction is required here that I'll just do it. So in this case, this will be K two. This will be K two. Okay. So. similarly we can write down the component balance for the uh, uh, component p component p is getting produced by uh, second reaction and it is getting consumed by the third reaction so that is also represented uh, using this mass balance and finally the last equation corresponds to the mass balance for the component g where you can see that uh, the g which is coming uh, through a recycle stream is taken as a input to the reactor and then g is getting produced by a third reaction so that is what is represented here in the third reaction okay <coughs> so clearly here in this entire uh, material balance equations you can see that fi represents the mass flow rate of the component i xi represents the weight fraction of the component i and kj represents the rate constant for the respective reactions again we can write down the expressions for the k1 k2 k3 in terms of the uh, in in the arrhenius form uh, because then that will give us the Uh, how the rate constant are constants are related to the temperature that effect can be built in uh, through this arrhenius equations now let's move to the another unit remember after reactor the next unit which is there in the process flow sheet if you look at the next unit is a heat exchanger so we will be looking at the equations with respect to the heat exchanger in the heat exchanger <coughs> so in, Uh, heat exchanger actually facilitates the exchange of heat between the stream so you can see that the hot product stream coming out from the reactor is cooled down in the heat exchanger so uh, <coughs> you can see that uh, if you look at the uh, heat balance so heat balance uh, if you consider the heat balance here the heat balance is nothing but the heat lost by the uh, the uh, uh, the effluent will be nothing but the heat gained by the coolant which is flowing through the heat exchanger okay again if you look at the mass balance equations with respect to the heat exchanger so there is no there is no uh, change in the mass flow rate of the different components is taking place and therefore f uh, fj ex which is nothing but the mass flow rate of different component j coming out from the exchanger is exactly same as fj e f f so uh, the mass flow rate of different components uh, is exactly same as the mass flow rate of different components which are coming in uh, through a effluent stream so the equation signify that the mass flow rate of each component remains constant through the heat exchanger indicating a simple exchange of material without any change in composition or mass within the unit the heat exchanger model serves the purpose of the transferring heat between the incoming and outgoing streams without altering the mass balance of the components that is what we have said so there is no change in the mass balance takes place only the heat is lost by the 
hot stream and the same amount of heat is gained by the coolant which is flowing through the heat exchanger. The next unit is a decanter. So, in decanter you can see that uh, the decanter unit which is there in the process flow sheet is primarily used to remove the uh, waste byproduct G. So, uh, the decanter assumes a perfect separation between the component G and the other components simplifying the separation process within the unit. The equations for the decanter unit are as follows. So, you can see that in this case uh, if you look at the mass flow rate of all the components except G are same as uh, whatever we have obtained uh, after the uh, heat exchanger. So, that is why FDI is same as FJEX. So, you can see that the mass flow rate of all the components are same in this case. Okay. Now, uh, this will be FJ. I will just correct. So, this will be J. Okay. So, again, again you can see that FDG is equals to 0. So, you can see that whatever the product is getting separated at the top from the decanter, it will not have any, uh, 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 it will not have the byproduct G because this byproduct G is getting separated at the bottom as a waste product. So, you can see that FG waste will be equals to uh, FG EX. So, that is nothing but whatever is the uh, input G. Uh, to the decanter, the same amount will be removed here at the bottom. And all other components other than G, this will be negligible. So, therefore, Fj West is equal to 0. So, you can see that uh, at the bottom, Fj West where J is varying as A, B, C, E, P. Uh, so, all other components will not be there in the bottom. So, these equations indicate that the mass flow rate of components A, B, C, E, and P remains unchanged while component G is completely separated within the decanter unit. Now, the last unit is uh, distillation column. So, the distillation column unit in the process flow sheet depicted in the figure is designated to separate the product P as overhead product whereas, uh, some amount of product P will be retained uh, in the bottom because of the azeotrope formation. Again, the distillation column assumes a pure separation of product P uh, at overhead and accounts for the retention of the portion of the product below the column due to azeotropic formation. So, if you look at the equations here, you can see that uh, if you look at the equations at the bottom, equations with respect to the uh, mass flow rate at the bottom. So, F i uh, F i bottom here is nothing but F d j. So, whatever the components are coming uh, from the decanter unit, the same uh, mass flow rate will be there for different components A, B, C, E at the bottom, is not it? Uh, again, F j product equals to 0. So, uh, whatever the product is taken out as, as a distillate, you can see that at the distillate, all these component j's will be absent. Whereas, at the bottom, we will have uh, this product P will be 0.1 multiplied by the mass flow rate of the component E. That is what the condition we have uh, uh, started with, is not it in the problem statement. So, due to azeotropic formation, some product equivalent to 10 percent of the mass flow rate of E remains in the bottom. So, equivalent to 10 percent of FDE uh, of uh, uh, product P will be in the bottom, whereas the other remaining part will be separated with the 100 percent purity as, as a top product. So, that is what is represented. You can see that FP product, this is nothing but the mass flow rate of the desired product P separated at the uh, distillate that is given as FDP minus 0.1 FDE. So, FDP is nothing but the mass flow rate of the product P entering in the distillation column minus 0.1 FDE is nothing but the equivalent amount of uh, product which will remain in the bottom. So, that is subtracted. So, remaining will be separated at the distillate. So, you can see that these are the four units. Uh, specifically, this simple flow sheet is taken because then you will appreciate how uh, these are solved in the modular as well as the equation oriented approach. So, <coughs> 
in addition to this remember in the process flow sheet if we look at whatever the bottom product coming out uh, this will be again given as a input to the splitter and the, in the splitter uh, uh, some part will be purged and the remaining part will be recycled back and this is very very important because we wanted to maintain a specific uh, a specific concentration of different components in the inlet isn't it so that is what we have seen earlier also when we have started looking at the uh, the mass and energy balance with a linear uh, mass and energy balance with linear equations in the initial uh, sessions isn't it so there also we have seen a similar case so in this case uh, finally, the bottom product coming out from the distillate, distillation column will be charged to the splitter unit where some part will be separated as a purge and the remaining will be recycled back. So, the flow splitter unit in the process flow sheet as depicted in figure is designated to split the incoming flow into two separate streams based on the specific split fraction. And this split fraction is very very important. This split fraction we have to decide based on what concentration we wanted to maintain in the recycle stream. Okay. So the flow splitter unit divides the incoming flow into two streams facilitating the distribution of components according to the defined split ratio. So in this case uh, Fj purge is given as eta into F bottom j. So here eta is nothing but the split fraction. So you can see that. Uh, uh, <coughs> some specific uh, amount specific fraction of the uh, the f bottom will be separated as a purge and the remaining 1 minus eta into fj bottom this much stream is recycled back the flow splitter unit plays a crucial role in the process flow sheet by allowing for the controlled splitting of flows which is essential for directing components to different parts of the process based on the desired distribution so this, this is what we were discussing isn't it in order to maintain the concentration of different components in the recycle stream isn't it that is what we are giving as a input to the uh, reactor in order to maintain that at a particular value we need to have a uh, you know uh, desired split fraction here we have to remove some part as a purge and the remaining has to be recycled back now coming back to the modular mode remember we said that this particular flow sheet we will uh, we will discuss how this particular flow sheet can be solved using modular mode so the modular mode in process simulation involves segregating process equations within individual units and executing these units sequentially so you can see that if i look at the entire uh, flow sheet here there are four uh, uh, there are in fact five uh, units are there reactor heat exchanger decanter distillation column and splitter there are five uh, units are there and all these five units we have to solve sequentially one after another okay so uh, if you look at the modular approach uh, the model corresponding to each of these units we are calling it as a uh, uh, model for the individual unit operations okay again in each of these unit operations we need to calculate different properties isn't it different thermodynamic properties we have to calculate so uh, that comes in the level 3 isn't it lowest level in the modular level uh, modular uh, approach isn't it and in addition to that remember when we are solving it sequentially we start with the assumption that uh, what will be the concentration of different species in the recycle stream that that fraction we start uh, we, we assume initially isn't it and based on that we are sequentially solving all these five units and based on that then finally again we calculate what is the uh, the concentration of different components which are present in the recycle uh, stream and if these are not matching in that case what we have to do is we have to do this simulation uh, repeatedly in a iterative manner till we match all these calculations so that is what is done in the uh, modular approach okay so in this the process equations are solved in a step by step manner with each unit being solved independently before moving on to the next unit the process in the modular mode is structured based on the flow sheet topology remember whatever the flow sheet is given and how different units are arranged sequentially the same sequence is followed in a modular approach 
where units such as reactor, heat exchanger, decanter, distillation column and splitter are executed in a specific sequence with defined input streams. So, you can see that if we uh, assume what, a, what are the uh, concentration of different streams in the recycle, uh, uh, recycle stream, based on that we can solve the mass and energy balance for the reactor, is not it? Based on that we will get what will be the, uh, the values with respect to the input stream which is there for the heat exchanger, is not it? So, you can see that if we, if we assume the uh, concentration of different components in the recycle stream, we know F 2 B, we know F A B, we can solve this reactor and we can obtain what are the values in the effluent. Is not it? That once we get what are the values in the effluent, what are the different mass fractions or uh, mass flow rates of different components in the effluent, what is the temperature of the effluent, based on that we can we can give that input to the heat exchanger. And heat exchanger based on this input then uh, how much amount of heat is removed based on that uh, the temperature will be changed here and mass flow rate will remain the same, is not it? That is what we said. Once we have done that we will get uh, the mass flow rate of different components in the uh, F x uh, stream, is not it? And that will be given as the input to the decanter and based on this input then we are going to solve the, uh, the uh, equations with respect to decanter, is not it? Here also uh, different in, in each of these unit you can see that the different uh, thermodynamic property one has to calculate, is not it? So, that we can calculate based on the temperature and pressure values whatever we are having along with the mass flow rate. So, once we uh, solve the equations for the decanter, we will get the output uh, variables coming out from the decanter which will be given as the input variables to the distillation column and then we can solve the model equation with respect to the distillation column. Based on that, we will get the uh, value of the variable F bottom, uh, different components those are present in the F bottom. Based on that, we can solve the uh, equations with respect to the splitter and finally, once we solve the expression for the splitter, we will be getting what will be the, uh, the uh, concentration of different components in the recycle stream and that we are going to check with respect to whatever we have assumed in the starting. If these are not matching, then we have to solve this entire calculation repeatedly till we get uh, both these values, starting values and the predicted values same. Uh, till that point we have to perform the iterations. So, you can see that the distillation, the initialization process in the modular mode involves guessing initial flow rates for certain streams and iteratively updating these values to achieve convergence in the simulation. Okay. The modular mode simplifies the simulation process by encapsulating unit models as procedures enabling the evaluation of the output streams based on the input stream and design parameters. So, you can see that individual, remember in this modular mode we are solving individual units sequentially one after another. So, solution of these individual units we can consider as different steps in the solution procedure that is what is written here. If you look at the entire uh, methodology is represented schematically here, you can see that uh, we are solving the unit operation models. For unit operation models, we require different properties. So, we will be solving the physical property models based on the thermodynamics or uh, different empirical rules. Based on that, we will be obtaining the uh, physical properties. These physical properties at the given condition, we are going to use at different unit operations. Then we are going to solve the non-linear model equations corresponding to each of these unit units. And once we have solved that, then we are going to combine all these unit operation solutions with respect to how sequentially different units are arranged in a flow sheet topology. In fact, this unit operation, uh, uh, we have to, whenever we are solving this unit operation models, you can see that the output of one is given as an input to the other. So, in fact, there is a back and forth. Uh, information exchange between flow sheet topology and unit operation models and same thing is happening with respect to all these, is not it? So, there is a back and forth calculation of the physical properties depending on the change in the temperature, pressure, etcetera, is not it? Okay. 
so in a modular mode you can see that if you look at the hierarchy in the modular mode hierarchical structure of the simulation process involves three main levels of the operation and these three main levels we have shown here isn't it so the lower level is the physical property models intermediate is the unit operation models and at the high level it's a flow sheet topology which we are trying to solve so at the top level the focus lies on the overall flow sheet topology involving sequencing unit modules so how sequentially different uh, unit operations are arranged initializing the flow sheet so uh, initially we have to start with some assumptions with that what will be the output identifying the recycle loops identifying the recycle loops and tier scheme this is a very very important uh, aspect and we will see some more details on this so for a very simple uh, williams and otto uh, flow sheet which is a very simple there is only one recycle stream is there but when you look at the real uh, plant if you look at the refinery there are several you know, thousands of the recycle streams are there isn't it so identifying these recycle streams identifying remember you have to solve this entire flow sheet so when you wanted to solve this entire flow sheets in a sequential manner remember the sequential word is extremely important when we are talking about the modular approach we are trying to solve each of these units one after another in the same sequence the way they are appearing in the flow sheet isn't it so identifying different loops also identifying tier uh, streams so tier streams are nothing but uh, we have to identify those streams if we break the uh, that particular stream some of the recycle loops are broken down so if you if you remove the recycle loop then then you can do the calculations in the sequential manner so this tier streams are very very important we have to identify these tier streams and we have to break the flow sheet at these tier streams based on that the recycle loop is broken and then we can do the calculations in a in a sequential manner and finally ensuring the convergence of mass and energy balance across the flow sheet is important okay so this is what happens at the top level so top level we are performing this iterations to match the uh, energy balance and the mass balance in the flow sheet what happens in the middle level the middle level is concerned with the unit operation procedures and serves as a repository uh, of unit models so when we are saying repository of the unit model what it means is models with respect to individual units are solved separately in fact if you look at most of these plant designing uh the large scale plant designing this is done mostly using the modular approach you you uh, try to simulate each of these individual unit operations one by one in a sequential manner isn't it so repository of the unit models uh, are there then each solved with the specialized calculation procedures depending on what input are there and what output you are desiring inputs from the top level including the input streams and parameters are provided for to each, each unit so remember output of each unit is given as a input to the next unit which is there in the sequence in the uh, uh, topology in the flow sheet topology isn't it so you can see that there is a back and forth information transfer is occurring between the middle level and the top level so inputs from the top level including the input streams and the parameters are provided to each unit and outputs from the units are fed back to the top level once the unit calculations are completed so once the unit calculations are completed these output values again we fit to the top level and then top level is again transferring that information to the next unit which is there in the sequence so this level <coughs> encompasses separators reactors transfer units and other units those are present in the uh, flow sheet finally the last level is a lowest level is nothing but the physical property models so physical property models uh, these include basically thermodynamic models for phase equilibria enthalpy entropy density calculation etc these models are frequently assessed by unit operation procedures as well as both uh, top level isn't it so middle level as well as top level both the levels are accessing uh, uh, these physical property models isn't it for flow sheet initialization and uh, stream calculations <laughs> so each level operates largely independently with minimal communication between them this streamlined approach allows the simulator to focus on one task at a time enhancing the efficiency and clarity in the simulation process again 
the flow sheet topology involves identifying recycle loop and tear streams for the unit sequence this is very very important primarily because uh, <coughs> so see you wanted to minimize the number of tier streams so if you perform if you minimize the number of tier streams then 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 your calculation becomes very easy isn't it and also your convergence improves in the in this analysis the selection of tier streams plays a pivotal role with the reactor feed frequently chosen uh, due to its significance in the overall process dynamics okay so uh, selecting the tier streams is very very important very often we select the input to the reactor as a tier stream and that is what we have seen in the previous case also you can see that when i am saying that we are assuming uh, the inlet uh, concentration of the uh, uh, different components in the recycle stream these two are known so clearly the inlet to the reactor is what we are considering as a tier stream isn't it so we are breaking this loop here we are breaking this loop here somewhere and that is why we could able to do the calculation sequentially in a forward direction isn't it <laughs> so when identifying the tier streams uh, a critical consideration is selecting those capable of breaking all recycle loops thereby facilitating smoother convergence addressing the specific challenge of recycle convergence involves considering a more focused fixed point relation x equals to gx where x is represents the estimated tier stream flow rate vector and gx denotes the corresponding calculated uh, stream flow rate vector so what it is so this particular point saying is what we are starting with the assumed value of x we are starting with the assumed values of the concentration of different components which are coming as a recycle stream to the reactor isn't it and then again after the splitter we are again calculating these values so these calculated values are nothing but what gx and this should match whatever we have assumed and whatever we are getting after performing the calculation as a input this should match and if these are not matching we have to perform this calculation iteratively for several iterations till these are matching so keeping tier streams minimal and ensuring they don't adversely interact during the convergence offers computational advantage this is also very very important um, <coughs> point so convergence depends on the tier stream so clearly minimizing the number of you know tier streams and selecting the 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 uh, the uh, most reasonable tier streams is very very important okay <laughs> so as i said when we wanted to solve this flow sheet which is given by williams and otto what we have to do we have to break this recycle loop isn't it so our tier stream is the input to the reactor isn't it once we have done that then this loop is broken so clearly now we are solving it in a sequential manner isn't it so that is what is represented in this particular slide so you can see that we have broken the uh, recycle loop here okay <coughs> so for this given flow sheet uh, the different steps involved are this identification of the tier stream so solving the williams auto flow sheet begins with identifying the streams that break all recycle loops isn't it remember our aim is what uh, we want so see ultimately why this tier stream is coming into the picture what this tier stream actually mean tier stream is nothing but we wanted to break the uh, particular stream and because of that if i am uh, uh, if i am eliminating the recycle that is what is called as a tier stream so if i eliminate this recycle then then i can do the calculations in sequential manner so that is why identifying uh, these tier streams is very very important so in this particular case only one tier stream is there isn't it but if you look at the complex flow sheet you will have multiple choices isn't it it's very very uh, you know uh, it is in fact combinatorial problem to find out the uh, the number of tier streams okay that that also we will discuss towards the end okay so the choice of tier stream is flexible since there there is only one recycle loop allowing any stream within it to serve as a tier stream conventionally the reactor inlet stream is selected as the tier stream for the process okay so unit once once this identification of the tier stream that is the uh, 
uh, first step then unit solution processes after that what we are going to do units within the flow sheet such as reactor heat exchangers decanter distillation column and splitter are solved following the flow sheet topology table so whatever the flow sheet topology is there how sequentially the units are arranged this flow sheet topology which we are saying uh, this is also very important term here in this case we can visually see in a in a williams and otto flow sheet we can see uh, different unit operations sequentially but when when we look at a complex uh, flow sheet where there are lot of recycles are there in that case partitioning this entire uh, topology into different groups is very very important and these individual groups are then solved okay so that also we will see uh, as we go ahead so this process involves computing the output streams of each unit based on specified inputs and parameters so module module input specifications in this case are ensuring the proper specification of the inputs is crucial for maintaining the simulation integrity in each module of the modular mode so depending on what inputs you are giving to each of these unit you will get the output so clearly specifying the uh, input parameters is very very important here the key parameters for the williams auto flow sheet includes feed flow rates then reactor volume and splitter pulse fraction these are the different inputs we have to specify and based on that you can perform all the calculations and once you do the calculations then you are going to cross check all these terms one more time okay so problem initialization problem initialization entails making initial guesses for parameters like flow rates remember that is what i said initial uh, flow rates uh, <coughs> in the recycle stream that you have to assume followed by iterative evaluation of the calculated values again you are going to calculate these flow rates in the recycle at the end and then you have to perform the matching of that iteratively executing unit sequences starting from the reactor determines input streams for each unit driving flow sheet convergence so you we can we can execute the uh, uh, the the simulation of individual units one after another and finally uh, we will be looking at the convergence of the all the units okay so flow sheet convergence when we are saying when when we are saying the flow sheet convergence means whatever the assumed values we had in the starting uh, equipment that should match with respect to the recycled values we are getting so once that is matching then we are saying that the flow sheet is converged so flow sheet convergence in the modular mode is typically framed as a fixed point equation iteratively determining the output stream values for the convergence multiple passes through the flow sheet may be uh, necessary to ensure the simulation accuracy and efficiency so uh, <coughs> the recycle convergence algorithm plays a vital role in achieving the overall solution accuracy the same thing which i am discussing uh, here that you get the output match with the assumed input and then you iteratively do this procedure till it is matching that is what is called as flow sheet convergence the final point is process demonstration solving the williams auto flow sheet in modular mode showcases a systematic approach to analyzing and integrating individual units so what we have seen is if you solve these one after another you can see that in fact we can match the input to the output now let's look at so so far we were discussing about the modular approach remember we said that there are two approach for solving the process flow sheet another approach is a equation oriented mode so in equation oriented mode what we are doing is remember all the equations we have the, uh, written for the individual units isn't it all these e equations in a modular approach we were solving the equations corresponding to each unit one by one sequential manner now in a in a equation oriented mode what we are doing is we are solving all these equations simultaneously that is what the equation oriented mode is so equation oriented process simulation the focus lies in solving flow sheet equations simultaneously departing from the modular approach it involves combining all process equations and variables into a unified system for simulation uh, for simultaneous solution the structure of the equation oriented mode emphasizes integrating unit operations physical property models and flow sheet topology into a comprehensive uh, set of 
equation. So you can see that in a in a equation oriented mode, all these equations, including property, including uh, including the uh, different unit operations, and also the flow sheet topology with respect to all, including the recycle and all, all these equations are solved together in a simultaneous manner. So equation oriented simulations are adept at managing large systems of equation with sparse structure. This word sparse is very very important here. Why? Because if your equations are not sparse and they are involving several variables in that case your equations have large amount of non-linearity and solving such complex non-linear equation by using the non-linear uh, equation solvers is going to be difficult and is going to uh, it may diverge also sometimes. So that, then it depends on how uh, you know uh, uh, how good a initial guess is given to such non-linear equation solvers is, isn't it. So it depends on several factors. So but if your equations are sparse in that case only few variables are associated with each of these equations clearly the equations are not that complex and you can solve these equations easily. <coughs> So only a fraction of variables are involved whenever we are having a sparse representation in that case only a fraction of variables are involved in each equation optimizing convergence speed compared to the modular approach. So in that case you will see that uh, the equation oriented approach uh, is going to give you a much faster and much comprehensive solution compared to a modular approach. So despite a faster convergence and more efficient solution equation oriented simulators necessitates careful initialization and problem specific strategies for successful resolution. As I said simultaneous solving of flow sheet equations requires a robust large scale non-linear equation solver and meticulous attention to problem setup for convergence. So what initial values you are giving, what non-linear equation solver you are using, it, it, uh, the solution depends on these uh, in a large extent. So initialization in the equation oriented mode is a problem specific and may entail grouping equations into a modular structure to facilitate successful resolution. Very, uh, you know, in some cases whenever you have uh, a large number of equations are there in such cases you sometimes you group these equations also in a, in a modular approach similar to a modular approach. Okay. So now this is what the the uh, all the set of equations are there for uh, equation oriented approach. Remember in this case uh, in this particular slide you can see that I have shown the equations for the reactors. These are the equations with respect to reactors. In addition to that we will have the equations for the kinetic uh, uh, this rate constant calculations isn't it. So those equations I have not shown here but even we will have equations for k1, k2, k3. These are the equations with respect to the heat exchanger, these are the equations with respect to the uh, decanter, then these are the equations with respect to the distillation column and then finally uh, again in addition to that uh, these are the equations with respect to the splitter and all these uh, equations we have to solve in addition to the property calculations and uh, based on that. Uh, uh, you can see that all these equations are non-linear so clearly a non-linear uh, uh, solvers which can obtain the uh, so solution of these equations one has to employ. So the structure of the equations impact the efficiency of the solution process. Typically each equation involves only a few variables usually two or three emphasizing their sparse nature. Exploiting the problem structure at the equation level allows for specifying the degree of freedom. So knowing the degree of freedom is also very very important here otherwise you end up with getting no solution at all. If, if the degree of freedom, uh, so see in this case you are solving large number of equation together. So calculating the degree of freedom is also very important here. If your degree of freedom is not correct and if you are giving more number of equations than uh, the uh, number of variables you end up with getting uh, erroneous solutions or no solutions. Okay. So methods for solving the non-linear equation, remember I said that all these equations are non-linear uh, in nature. So typically if you look at all these uh, solvers which are employed in uh, several uh, uh, process simulation softwares like Aspen, HiSys, etc. Isn't it? So these are um, you know uh, 
uh, Aspen Hisys and all these are based on the modular approach, but also there are some softwares which can solve the equation oriented uh, uh, formulation also. So, in all such solvers you will see that the workhorse for those solvers is a Newton Raphson method. So, we will discuss that. So, methods for solving the non-linear equations play a crucial role in process simulation particularly in handling the complex systems where linear approximations are inadequate. Remember we started initially when we have looked at the preliminary flow sheet designing there we have used the linear balances is not it. We have linearized all our equations is not it. But th those linearization is going to give you only the approximate solution. Once that initial part is done uh, in between you wanted to get the more accurate solution. So, more accurate solution you can get by solving the non-linear equations. So, non-linear equation solving techniques are essential for achieving convergence in process flow sheet simulations and optimizing the system performance. These non-linear equations have a general form like this f of x equals to 0. So, this is kind of uh, these equations will be kind of you know equations for root finding. So, f of x equals to 0 I wanted to find out the values of x for which f of x becoming 0. So, this is kind of solving uh, the equations where you are trying to find out the values of x which are satisfying all these equations. So, it is in a way is nothing but root finding. A typical uh, uh, solvers used for solving such problems is a Newton Raphson. So, Newton Raphson method if you look at it has a uh, it has a form like this. So, this is for a root finding. So, x k plus 1 is given as x k minus f of x k divided by f dash x k. So, here you can see that f of x k is the function value at uh, the, uh, the kth iteration. f dash x k is the derivative value of the function at uh, kth iteration and based on that we can find out what will be the value of x at k plus 1th iteration, is not it. So, you can see that this, this particular Newton Raphson method is for the root finding, but there is something called as a Newton's method which is used for the optimization. So, when, when we are using the Newton's method in that case the same equation is modified and in that case uh, the equation becomes x k plus 1 is given as x k minus f dash x k divided by f double dash x k. So, you can see that there the denominator will be a Hessian matrix whereas, uh, the, the numerator will be uh, Jacobian. Okay. So, in this case now the denominator is a Jacobian matrix. Okay. So, <coughs> in addition to this solving f of x equals to 0, sometimes we also wanted to solve at a fixed form. Fixed form in uh, fixed point form is what? Uh, basically, you are trying to match your output to the assumed output. So, in a way x is given to the g of x. So, uh, depending on what type of equations you are solving, uh, sometimes you can uh, select a Newton Raphson method or some other solvers also. So, Newton Raphson method stands out as the most utilized approach. In process simulation, it serves as the foundational algorithm. So, you can see that all these solvers used are some way or the other derivative of the Newton Raphson method for the equation oriented mode and finds frequent application in solving equations for unit operations. Additionally, quasi Newton or uh, Broyden methods are also used in this context. Okay. The next approach is the fixed order fixed point method. So, when we are trying to match our output to the assumed input, these approaches do not rely on derivative information. So, very often you know our equations are so see when we are trying to match x equals to gx this is kind of you know whenever we are trying to look at what will be the concentration of different components in the recycle is not it. So, in such cases finding the derivative is not easy. So, in such cases remember Newton's method here Newton's method or all the methods which are derived from the Newton's method they are based on derivatives. But in, in the other case where we are trying to match our output with the, uh, uh, the assumed input to the uh, reactor in the recycle stream, in such cases finding the derivative is not easy and in, in, in such uh, uh, require in, in order to so satisfy such requirements one has to use the methods which do not require the derivative and one such method is shown here. So, secant method is shown. So, secant method is kind of extended version of the Newton Raphson method itself. The only difference here is this derivative we have obtained as a difference equation. here. You can see that f dash x k instead of f dash x k now we have written here it as f x b minus f x a divided by x b minus x a. So, this is a difference equation we have written. Okay. 
So clearly we do not require a derivative. Here only we require a function value at two points A and B. And based on that, we can calculate the difference and that difference we can use as a derivative and then we can find out the new value of the x, isn't it? And once we get the new value of x, we are going to, we are going to uh, eliminate some of the search space. So, if you look at the second method, second method uh, basically based on not just the concept of the Newton Raphson, but it also based on the concept of eliminating the search space. So, it eliminates the search space based on what value of uh, x new we are getting. And then we are going to look at x new value, whether this x new value uh, uh, and whether this x new value is between x a and x b. If it is between x a and x b, in that case, uh, the search space between x a and x new that will be eliminated and our new search space will become x new to x b, is not it? So, clearly you can see that as we progresses for different iteration, you will see that even the second method will approach to the global optimum or a, a desired solution. Okay. If you take the example of Newton Raphson method, as remember I said that sometimes such these derivative based methods are really tricky. So, you can see that this Newton Raphson method sometimes uh, you know it may diverge also. If you if you select your initial value, remember this particular method, uh, both these methods are requiring the initial values. So, depending on what initial values you are starting with, based on that sometimes your algorithm may diverge also. Now, let us move to the last part of this session and this is very very important recycle partitioning and tiering. This is this is extremely important when you are trying to solve the uh, process flow sheet by using the uh, modular approach. So, recycle partitioning and tiering algorithms are essential in modular process simulation for handling recycle streams and ensuring the convergence in the flow sheet calculation. Okay. So, these methods are particularly important in systems with recycle loops where mass and energy balances need to be closed effectively. Now, uh, in order to understand, remember so far we were looking at a very simple flow sheet, Williams and Otto. Let us look at slightly more complicated flow sheet where there are several uh, recycling streams are there. So, you, you will see this, this is the new flow sheet. This, this flow sheet is given by Leslie M. E. in his book computer aided process plan design. So, you can see that now making the decision is not easy. Can you find out how many recycle streams are here uh, just by visual inspection in one go? It is not possible. It is really difficult to find out the number of recycle streams and also it is difficult to find out uh, what will be the different tiering streams and not just that, what sequence I should follow in a modular uh, approach for calculation. Finding these things are not easy when I am having a complicated uh, uh, flow sheet of the given plant, is not it? So, this is what we are trying to understand here. So, you can see that recycle partitioning and tiering algorithms are essential. These methods are particularly important in systems with recycle loops where mass and energy balance need to be closed effectively. In the process flow sheet from the literature, the same which I have shown, you can see that there are different units are like there like A, B, C, D and E are there uh, form a recycle loop. So, you can see that if I go in this particular thing, you can see that A, B, C, D and E, these are forming a recycle loop. So, I can clearly say that there is a recycling is happening here. In addition to that, I can consider even, so see, uh, the output from the C is going to F and then it is going to G and it is again coming back. So, I can take even F and G into the consideration. So, A, B, C, D, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, this can be considered as a one group here, is not it? So, I can go in a sequential manner in solving these groups, these, these units here. Is not it? But how about the remaining part? This part I can visualize easily, but visualizing the other parts is not that easy. <coughs> so, such groups like A, B, C, D, E, F, G units that need to be solved together. Okay. So, you can see that we have identified that A, B, C, D, E from the recycle loop and must be computed together, is not it? Clearly, because they are part of the same loop. Similarly, F and G we can connect with them, is not it? So, finding such groups, finding such groups which need to be solved together, that is what is called as partition. So, this entire group is called as a partition and this entire procedure is called as partitioning. So, whenever I am having a complicated flow sheet, the first step 
in a in a modular approach which we have to do is we have to partition this particular flow sheet into different partitions in in, in each of these partitions we will have a, a group of different units and this group of different units has to be solved separately okay so the order in which these partitions must be solved is known as precedence ordering so this is also important in which order all these partitions has to be solved isn't it so in this case this is one partition isn't it and again in addition to this one partition there will be several other groups will be there in what sequence these groups should be solved isn't it so that is called as precedence ordering and the last point here is while the grouping of the units into partitions is unique the ordering may be depending on the specific flow sheet so what we are trying to say is for a given process flow sheet you will see that your uh, partition groups will be unique if you follow the procedure you will get the unique uh, partition groups but which order should be followed that may not come unique okay that may depend on uh, what you are starting with okay so now let us let us do the partitioning and obtaining the tier streams for this particular complicated uh, slightly more complicated uh, process flow sheet so the first task we are going to do is the recycle partitioning so a simple algorithm exists to find the partitions and precedence ordering in any given flow sheet this algorithm is illustrated on the given flow sheet here so you can see that the first step is arbitrarily select any unit let's say unit i we have selected so unit i is where unit i is here this unit i i have selected arbitrarily i could have selected any other unit isn't it then after that what we do is we are putting that unit in the list one put it in the list one so list one is now comprised of unit one okay so for unit uh, unit one uh, for unit i we trace its output stream so we we look at this unit i we try to find out what are the output streams it is having so in this case you can see that this is one output stream from unit i this is also another output stream from unit i so you can see that if i take this output stream then i try to connect all the output streams so you can see that for unit i we trace its output streams adding each new unit to our list until we encounter a repetition or reach a dead end with no further output so we continue adding individual units uh, based on if there is a output stream present isn't it and we continue till we come back to the original unit or a repeating unit or there is a dead end tracing outputs so uh, if we are tracing the outputs from uh, i we can go from i to j you can see if i look at from i to j i can go from j to k i can go from k to l i can go from l to m i can go from m to n i will go from n i will come back again to l isn't it so now there is a repeat unit yeah from l i have gone to m n and then again come back to l okay so we have to continue till there is a repetition okay so in this case you can see that from i we will go to j j to k k to l k to m l to m and m to n and finally l so now you can see that this l and this unit l both are repeating so when we are identifying a repetition we group the units in a in the loop and treat them as a single entity so the here l m n these these three units we have to group them and we have to consider them as a single unit okay so we can loop them we can we can we can group them in a single unit and that that is represented by this uh, a bracket so now now you can see that after grouping this this is what we have obtained i j k and this l m n we have grouped them in a one unit so that is why this uh, curly bracket is there isn't it so this l m n we have grouped as a single unit now let's look at uh, continue the tracing the output okay so after that again we can we can consider the tracing the output so you can see that from l i can go to o remember i i reach to l and then from i can go to o then i can go to p and from p i can go to k and k is what i have started with isn't it so in this case in this case we will go to o p k and now there is a repetition between k and k here so again we have to group all these units which are present between these repetitions so that is what we have done so we have grouped them k l m and o p we have grouped them in one unit again we can go ahead isn't it so this group this group we are now considering a single entity 
this entire group we are con considering a single entity so now you can see that again in this case uh, <coughs> from here you can see that we can we can again go from uh, here m to s q r j this is what we can go isn't this entire unit we have clubbed into one unit now now we can if we club them as a one unit there is a again output which is going to s from s we are going to q from q we are going to r and from r we are going to j isn't it so we can we can put that also here so s q r j we have put here now j is getting common here j is getting repeated so again we can group them together so that becomes j k l m n o p q uh, <coughs> uh, p q r j isn't it p s q r j this is what we have entire group we have obtained now now uh, once we have grouped that there is, then there is no output going after this after once we have grouped this entire when we have grouped this entire term here now there is no output going output going to a dead end like by product like created hydrocarbon product etc it is going to a dead end there is no output going to a unit from this if i if i look at this particular if i look at this particular part if i look at this particular part you can see that there is no output going to a diff other unit isn't it correct so this entire thing is one group isn't it <coughs> so here you can see that now this entire thing we have made one group after that the next step is we have to see remember i we have started isn't it i we have started we said i is going to j isn't it uh, and that was one output we have seen isn't it i is going to j but i can have another output to other unit also isn't it correct but i is going to q but q i have already included now here so there is no output going from i so this this becomes a dead end we don't have to go ahead with that so what we have to do here is once we have obtained this entire group this entire group we are going to copy in the list two and whatever remaining i that will again put it in the list two, one itself in the list one we are again going to see whether i is having another output going to other units in this case from i we are not going to any other new units at all so therefore this is a dead end okay so this i again go back to the list one and it remains at the top here okay now let's let's select the another unit now let's select the another unit arbitrarily maybe let's say f unit f we have selected so unit f we have selected isn't it so from f we have to see what is the output so let's say from f the output is h isn't it if i go from f to h and h to i i can go isn't it but i is already used in this one group so if i go from f to h there is a dead end remember this stream is coming in it is not a output only i have to look at whether there is a output stream or not so from f it is going to h and then there is a dead end so i will have another group from f to h that's it so that is what we have obtained here see we are starting from the f then it becomes fh isn't it after that there is a dead end so this fh also <coughs> is there so remember here f to h is going so h is going to uh, come back to the list two so h we have taken again copy to a uh, list two and it becomes at the top isn't it so h comes here and again we have to see whether f is having another output or not remember we have selected one output we have selected this output for the f but f is also having this output this particular direction we have not explored so now in list one i will have f and i am going to explore this direction so we will have f g we will have f g c d e a b isn't it and again it is coming back to c correct so that is what we are having in the next thing we are starting with f we are going to f from f it is going to g c d e a b and finally it is coming to c but c is getting common here so we have to group that c d e a b will be grouped here again again after this group there is a f which is output so this this entire thing which is uh, i have clubbed so they, from this i can go to f again isn't it so then there will be f also uh, at the end so c d e a b and f is there and f is common here so clearly we have to we have to take f g c d e a b as one single group now now all these units we have counted 
now this particular group i have to take as a uh, uh, this this particular group i have to take in the starting here in the list 2 so what what we will have in the list 2 now a b c d e a b as one group h separately i separately and the last group will be j k l m n o p s q r so now this particular list is very important why because now it is giving us that how we should group different units so we should group unit f g c d e a b as one unit and we have to solve the material and energy balance uh, all these equations we have to solve for this group first then the output from this group will be given as a input to the unit h we will be solving unit h from unit h we will be giving uh, the output to unit i we will be solving unit i and once we get the output for unit i then we will give it a, a, a input to this entire group j k l m n o p q o p s q r and in this manner this entire flow sheet one has to solve so clearly this is something called as partitioning so here we have partitioned the all the units into different groups you can see that this is the first group then second third and fourth there are four uh, groups we have obtained isn't it so we repeat this process until all units are accounted for in either list 1 and list 2 finally the list 2 represents our partitions in precedence order so this is in the precedence order this is how we have to process our material and energy balance calculations this meticulous approach ensures the systematic breakdown of the flow sheet facilitating the efficient solution strategies for complex process system so this is about the recycling partitioning and the last topic now remaining is a recycle tiering remember once we have found out the partitioning we have only obtained the information that how we should solve the material and energy balance in sequentially but one more information is required which stream should be used as a tiering stream so that these recycle loops are separated isn't it recycle loops are broken down okay so tiering is a crucial step in the process of solving partitions containing multiple units in a flow sheet it involves strategically selecting tier streams to break recycle loops and facilitate convergence in the process simulations the tiering process aims to identify key streams that can be removed temporarily from the system and because of that uh, because of that solution of the interconnected units uh, and improve the convergence behavior of the simulation once the approach one one approach to tiering involves analyzing the flow sheet to determine the most effective tier streams that can efficiently break the recycle loops without compromising the accuracy of the solution the tiering process is essential for handling complex recycle structures and ensuring the convergence of uh, iterative solution methods in process simulations by breaking recycle loops strategically engineers can simplify the solution process and achieve consistent and reliable results in flow sheet calculations okay so what we are trying to say here we are trying to say here is that for a given flow sheet we have to first find out the tiering streams again we have to minimize their numbers if you minimize the number of these tiering streams our uh, calculations becomes easy and also the convergence becomes easy okay the last point here is the advanced tiering techniques such as integer programming formulations can uh, can be used for optimization and can be employed to systematically select tier streams and optimize the convergence behavior of the simulation process so this part we are going to see so you will see that once we have obtained different recycle streams out of this recycle by considering this information about this recycle uh, uh, streams we can find out the tier streams and these tier streams we can find out by formulating the uh, formulating the set cover problem uh, this set cover problem is a is a combinatorial problem and this combinatorial problem can be solved by using the integer programming and once we solve this integer programming problem we get the optimized values of optimized number of the tiering streams this we can use and based on that we can break the entire flow sheet and and perform the calculations in a sequential manner so uh, let's look at for the same example so in the same example you can see that uh, remember we have done the partitioning we have done the partitioning so this is the uh, first group second third and this is the last group so we are going to perform the tiering for the last group j k l m n o p s q r so these are the units which are there so all other units we have removed from this flow sheet so from this flow sheet only this uh, only this j k 
आई जे के एल एम एन एस आर क्यू ऑल दीज यूनिट्स आर रिटेन एंड ऑल अदर यूनिट्स आर रिमूव एंड ऑल्सो दी आउटलेट स्ट्रीम्स एंड इनलेट स्ट्रीम्स विच आर नॉट कमिंग फ्रॉम दी इक्विपमेंट और नॉट गोइंग टू एनी अदर यूनिट दीज आर ऑल्सो रिमूव सो विद दैट विद दैट यू कैन सी दैट अवर प्रोसेस फ्लोशीट फॉर ओनली दिस पार्टीशन जे के एल एम एन ओ पी एस क्यू आर बिकम्स लाइक दिस सो आई हैव सेपरेटेड ऑल अदर पार्ट एंड एंड द स्ट्रीम्स इनपुट एंड आउटपुट स्ट्रीम्स विच आर नॉट गोइंग टू एनी यूनिट दीज आर ऑल्सो रिमूव सो दिस इज द प्रोसेस फ्लोशीट विच वी हैव ऑप्टेन नाउ इन दिस प्रोसेस फ्लोशीट अगेन दोज यूनिट्स which are having only single input and single output these are also omitted so that is what we have done see here q is having single input single output so that is also omitted so this is the uh, resultant uh, flow sheet which we have obtained after removing the uh, the the units which are uh, already uh, not there not there in this particular partition and also uh, also we have removed the units which are having single input and single output like the unit q where there is a single input and there is a single output so that is also we have eliminated from here so our resultant flow sheet becomes like this now this resultant flow sheet again can be represented in a simplified form in a simplified form like this so where where you can see that this in this e individual lines now represented as streams and these are represented with numbers so for instance you can see that from s to k this entire line is considered as one stream so from s to k uh, this particular stream is represented by uh, a number 8 so in a similar manner all the streams are represented with numbers like 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 now in this particular figure we wanted to find out how many uh, recycle uh, recycle loops are present and based on this recycle loop then we have to find out which uh, stream will be the best stream for uh, tier so now in this case again a simple algorithm is there we start with any unit in the partition for example let's say unit k we can take a unit k we can take a unit k so from unit k then we have to go in the forward direction so from k the only output is going to l and from l it is going to m and again from m it is coming back to l so you can see that k to l l to m and m to l and the in between uh, uh, what is the stream number that is represented here so you can see that from k to l the stream is 1 so from k to l the stream is 1 and from l to m the stream is 2 and from m to l it is coming back the stream is 3 so that is what is represented here so clearly this this particular uh, uh this particular unit is getting repeated here so this is a this is a loop clearly this is a loop so we can represent this loop in terms of the stream as 2 3 so the list 3 now we are making another third list which is uh, counting the loops here so we are having the loop between 2 and 3 so that is represented in the curly bracket here 2 to 3 is a loop okay so start with the unit just before okay so we have looped this we have looped this uh, unit uh, uh, l here isn't it so this 2 to 3 we have looped it isn't it so now again we are starting with the unit before the repeating unit so l is the repeating unit so we have to start with k so again we have to start with k and see whether there is a any other output is there trace the path from k to unit l and then to <coughs> unit m okay so in this case you can see that if you go from here l to m now you can see that if here from m there is another path is there isn't it from m we can go to s and from s it can go to k isn't it so that is what is represented in the next line so trace the path from unit k to unit l then to unit m and then back to unit l and finally uh, to unit s and k so it is going from k to l l to m and from m to l it is going but again from m it is going to s and from s it is going to k isn't it so there is a loop between these two so k unit is same so there is a definitely one more loop here so this also we can represented in a in a list 3 so list 3 i will have what are the what are the uh, streams here in between 1 2 3 7 and 8 so that becomes 1 2 7 and 8 isn't it so 2 3 we have done so 1 2 7 and 8 becomes the second loop here 
सो नोट दैट द यूनिट के रिपीट्स एंड द स्ट्रीम्स वन टू सेवन एट कनेक्टिंग द अपियरेंसेस ऑफ यूनिट के आर एडेड टू द लिस्ट ऑफ द लूप सो दैट बिकम्स वन टू सेवन एट नाउ रिमेम इन दिस केस अगेन अपॉन रिटर्निंग टू एस and exploring the alternate path from it none are found so what it means is you can see here at the s yes, we have reached isn't it in the second loop but from s there is no alternate path there is no outgoing here so yes we cannot uh, explore but you look at the l we can explore from l there is a alternate path which is going to o isn't it so note that l repeats and the two streams 2 and 3 Connecting the two appearances of unit L are placed on the list of. So here you can see that one two seven eight we have included here. Upon returning to S and exploring the alternate path from it, none are found. Revisiting unit M also yields no further exploration uh, path. So if we again go back to M here, from M there is only one outgoing which we have already explored. There is no alternate outgoing from M. However, retrac retracts retracing the uh, steps to L reveals an additional path as follows. So we can so see these two paths we have already found out. Remember, from L M L this is one loop. Then from M then there is a seven eight and then K isn't it? And from L is also there is an alternate route. You can see from L I can go to O and O to again I can come back to K isn't it? So this is what is represented here. So L to O and O to K and the stream name is represented here four and five. So we can see that here in this case one more uh, loop will come into the picture and that will become what one four five one four five. That is what the third loop is. Now there is one more loop is possible at the O. So you can see that O O there is two outputs are there. One is going one is going to K and another is going back to S. So there is one more loop is possible here from O. So we can have one more loop represented here, which will be from O, it is going to S, and from S to it is going to K. And their individual uh, stream numbers are also represented six and eight. So we will have a loop like one, four, six, eight, one, four, six, eight. So these are the uh, four loops which are possible. So you can see that upon returning to s then to o followed by l and finally to k no alternate paths from these units were discovered as we have returned to the initial uh, unit on the list our exploration concludes so there is no units re remaining resulting in four loops in the partition so these are the four loops are there now with respect to these four loops we have to uh, find out the tier streams so these loops are recorded in a loop incidence array as depicted in table so you can see that all these four loops are represented in the loop incidence array so this is the loop incidence array so first loop is what between 2 and 3 so these uh, particular uh, boxes are marked by x here but i could have used 1 and 0 so i could have used 1 uh, for x and uh, all blank spaces i could have used zero and that is what the representation used in solving the uh, the combinatorial set covering problem to find out the minimum number of tiers okay so in this case once this loop incidence array is found based on the loops we have obtained then we have to solve a combinatorial set covering problem and in this what we have to minimize is we have to minimize the count of tiers and once we solve this particular problem then we have to go ahead with the calculations okay so solving this set covering problem is not easy it's a combinatorial problem it is exponential time complex typically for a small number of uh, variables you can solve using the uh, deterministic methods usually people use the heuristic methods uh, in this case in this case you can see that integer programming methods one has to use to solve and once you get the number of tier streams then then you can perform the entire calculation so uh, we employ the reduction properties outlined above for the matrix analysis and then 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 this this entire matrix which we have obtained is very very important for solving this set covering problem and this particular problem is already solved in the book for a very simple case so we will not go ahead with that uh, so we stop here uh, and in the next session we will again start with the optimization thank you so much